What do you wonder? Ha. Huh. That's a good question. I wonder a lot about the future. I wonder if I am choosing the right pathway in terms of how I'm living my life. I wonder a lot of stuff. Like what's out in the universe. With the question, what do you wonder? I mean, we could, we could go really, really deep into this. I wonder how long I'm gonna have on this earth and if I'll accomplish my purpose. I wonder why people complain all the time. I wonder where I'm gonna be at in the next five to 10 years. We both wonder, I think, if, if there's ever gonna be grandchildren coming along. I wonder if my kids are going to have a good life. I wonder how we got here. What do we wonder about him? <laughs> I wonder when he's going to start to lose some weight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wonder. <laughs> Good morning, Katie Springs. How are you guys doing? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, yeah, I'm on good. You can hear me good? Okay, so we've been in this series, I wonder. Uh, last week, I talked about, uh, I wonder where we came from. It's like that little girl said, wonder where we came from. And I did bring up creation and evolution. And so my scientist friends have been coming out of the woodwork uh, this last week. And I love it. One of them sent me this. Um, I always cringe a bit when people bring up this topic since the work I do is to support scientists. And then this was, this was his praise for me. Okay, you ready? I mostly wanted to say you didn't completely botch the definition of evolution. That was really good. <laughs> I should feel really encouraged by that, right? You know what? I wanted you to, guys to understand something about Canyon Franks. We are here for questions. You don't have to agree with me. If you don't agree with me, you can come and talk and we'll open up the discussion. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we started the podcast that Jonathan and I have uh, 10 Steps Further, so that we can begin the conversation that wherever you're at in your spiritual journey. And so regardless of whether you believe in me or believe with me or believe in the same things that I do, we can still be friends and we can still gather for tacos and yes, hot dogs. So just let, let me know. Anything that, anything that you come up with, we'd, we'd, I'd just love to hear about it. Okay, so today I want to start off with a question, right? In fact, I'm going to make you share it with the person next to you. You ready? What is the best day of your life, all right? What would you nominate best day ever? If you, if you like the person next to him, talk to him. If you don't, tough. Do it anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> Alright, so I got a couple that I want to nominate, alright? Okay, the first one I don't think you can dispute. Best day ever, alright? Ready? The day you were born. How can you dispute that? I don't remember that. You can't dispute that because if it wasn't for that day, then none of these other days that you're talking about would even matter, right? But there's so, there's so many days. Like, smart husbands, what did you say? Right? <laughs> the day you got married, hopefully. Did he, did your husband say that? See, you, you know why, right? We're all, we're all on this point system. <laughs> we're all on this point system. Some of you might have said, yeah, I, I see some of you have kids. Did you guys say you, the day your kids were born? Did you say that? You did say that. Like, the, our kids don't accept our points. 
<laughs> they don't care about that. But I do remember that. I remember my first son coming out, and he's all covered with blood, and I'm just bawling. It was amazing. I love, love that day. Uh, I'm guessing there are some, some other big days, you know, like graduation days might be one, or, or vacations, or maybe like your favorite Christmas or something that you might nominate. Um, I've got another nomination for you, all right? Here's the one I think is number one. And it's this day. It's today. Because you might have had a lot of great moments in the past. You might remember you when your kids were born and when you and you know birthdays and celebrations and Christmases or when you when you got your Tesla, that might have been a great day for you. Really fun for you. But those are all in the past. And there might be some other amazing days in your future, you know. I know some of you are looking forward to retirement. Man, that would be so great. And all those people who are sitting here with their kids, you're looking forward to when your kids are gone. That would be great. So many amazing things that might happen to you. But listen, that's where those events are stuck as well. It's today. This day. God put it like this. Psalm 118. Maybe you've heard this verse. Psalm 118, 24. I'll put it up on the screen behind me. This, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, in this one. You only get one. In the past, you can't live in, and the, the future just worries you. This is the day. Uh, John Orberg put it like this. He's an author, my favorite author. If we don't rejoice today, we will not rejoice at all. If we wait until conditions are perfect, we'll still be waiting when we die. If we're going to rejoice, it must be this day. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is it. You know, as I was thinking about this topic, uh, made me think, this is one area of our life that we get progressively worse at as we get older. You know, a lot of areas of our life, you know, you might learn patience, you may deal with your anger, whatever, but as we get older, we're like, we're like way worse. We, we start off as experts and we end as novices. Um, have you ever spent any time with a kid? I mean, they are in this moment. They are in the present. Uh, I remember my youngest. Okay, so my, well, I've added one since. So my youngest, then we added one, so my 18-year-old, uh, who I drop off for college on Friday. I know, so old. Um, but I remember when she was a little kid. And when every day started out almost the identical way. Uh, we'd go into her room and we'd wake her up and she'd wander into our room after she woke up and, and she, we, she'd say something like, Mommy, do I have preschool today? And if we said yes, she would say, Yay! And then she would wander in other days and say, Mommy, do I have preschool today? But it was Saturday. We'd say, No, honey, you don't have preschool today. To which she would respond, Yay! It just almost didn't matter. You know, hey, we're going to the dentist today. You have to have that ex tooth extracted. Yay! Oh, we can't find the ear thermometer. We're going to use the rectal one. Yay! <laughs> It was just her life. And when we're young, we're in the moment, we experience these great things and we, we celebrate them. And yet, as we get older, it becomes harder and harder and harder. And we, we lose our yay, don't we? And, and I'm thinking about the past and some of the things that happened in the past and how much better those were. And I'm looking off into the future and hoping for this and hoping for that and hoping for that raise and hoping for that retirement. And man, then won't that be great? You know, and you think, wow, maybe when the house is empty or when my kid graduates or when my kid finally gets married, then those days would be great. And we lose the yay. And God wants us to experience that in this moment. When I was writing this message, I looked up the word joy in the Bible and I read every verse that had that word in it. 
to try to figure out how we can get the yay back into our lives. So I'm going to give you four ways that we can do that. Before we do that, would you do me a favor? Would you bow your head? I want to just give you 30 seconds. Because God can speak to you in ways that I cannot. And you're kind of pretty much stuck here. You know? It would be awkward for you to leave right now. So... Uh, that's all you're going to do for the next several minutes. So I want you to just take a moment and say, God, would you speak to me today? Lord God, I pray that you would be in this room. I pray that your spirit would come in. I pray that, God, that you would help us to find that joy in our lives that we, we just can't seem to find. And God, maybe there's some people who are in really rough parts of their life right now, but I pray, God, that you would speak to them. We love you, God. Thanks for meeting us here. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so today, my message is, I wonder what happened to my happy. Um, you know, happy seems to be part of what we all want. In fact, our Declaration of Independence declares our even right to have it, right? You know, the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But how do we get there? Uh, actually, I'm going to challenge you to something even greater than happy today. I'm going to challenge you to what the Bible calls deep joy. Um, and there's uh, four different principles I want us to look at. I'll try to make it easy as possible. And the first is this. It's the why settle for less principle. You know, we're forever being told this. You know, you deserve the best. You've tried the best. You've tried the rest, not tried the best. You know, you're worth it. Treat yourself, right? We were told this kind of stuff all the time, and pretty much we take advantage of it, except in this one area of our life. We're willing to take less than the best when it comes to joy, this is what God promises us. I put it up on the screen. A bunch of different verses of the kind of joy that God says that we can have. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8 says overflowing joy. Uh, Deuteronomy 16, God says he will give us complete joy. Nehemiah 8, he'll give us great joy. Psalm 28, this kind of jump out of your socks joy. It says my heart leaps for joy. And I'll give thanks to him in song. Isaiah 51 promises us everlasting joy. 2 Corinthians 7, 4 says joy that knows no bounds. That's the kind of joy that God wants us to have that doesn't matter about circumstance, and yet we settle for less than the best. Let me give you a couple ways we settle. One, stuff joy. We lean on stuff to give us joy. And listen, I don't have a problem with stuff. I like stuff. If you want to give me stuff, I'm happy to get your stuff. Some people give me their used stuff. I'm okay with your used stuff. Because a lot of times your used stuff is better than my new stuff. Especially your cars. So, you know, come on, bring it on. But we put a lot of time and effort and we just think, if, if I just get that thing, if I just get that one thing, if I just get that car, if I just get that fridge, if I just get that remodel, or if I just get those shoes, then that's going to bring me joy. And none of us would ever say this out loud. But you know, there's this little pop of adrenaline when you click that button on Amazon and two days later it's going to be there. There's that little bit of joy that we get. You know, it's funny, I went to a buddy's house and uh, this was in the day when I had an analog TV. Does anybody remember an analog TV? That thing, that giant, I mean, it was massively heavy and you couldn't see things clearly at all and that's what I still had and I was too cheap to buy a new one. And so I went over to my buddy's house and he had a big old 50 inch, which for some of you are looking down your nose, 50 inch. He had a 50 inch flat screen HD and this was the kind of TV where you could see the nose hairs on the newscasters, right? And you, you felt like you had to wipe off the TV after basketball was on because you see the sweat dripping down. And I remember something that he said. I can't wait for it to break because I want to get a new one. 
Now here's the crazy thing. I can relate to that. I like stuff. I want to get new stuff. And yet in all of my looking through the Bible, there was only one passage that had anything to do with stuff and joy, and it was in 2 Chronicles 7. And in 2 Chronicles 7, all the people of Israel had put their money together to build a temple for the house of God, and this is what it says, 2 Chronicles 7. On the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people to their homes joyful and glad in heart for the good things the Lord had done for David and Solomon and for the people of Israel. And the joy that they came wasn't from getting stuff. It was from giving stuff. And they pooled all their resources and they built this great house and let's take an offering. I'm kidding. <laughs> if you have not learned this already, you need to learn it now that there is more joy in giving than there will ever be in getting. And if you're settling for stuff joy, you're settling for less than the best. Let me give you another kind of joy that we, we settle for. We settle for buzz joy. You know, it's funny, when you look at, you know, say yes to the best and why settle for less, it sounds like a beer commercial because it is, because that's what we look for, for joy. And I don't want to step on anybody's toes because, and, and the Bible really does talk about alcohol and it doesn't say it's all bad. In fact, if Jesus was here, he'd wonder why this wasn't wine. Um, why we have grape juice. He didn't turn the water into grape juice, he turned the water into wine. And there are times when they had great celebrations and there was wine involved. But, how many of us rely on alcohol for that joy? That little, that little pop. And this is how we celebrate. Uh, let me ask you a question, and I'm really stepping on toes here, so forgive me. If your kids were interviewed, and they were asked, what does it take to throw a really good party for adults? Would they have on their list that alcohol would have to be a part of it? Now, look, um, it, the reason I bring it up is for a couple reasons. One, you got to be careful of the kind of legacy that you leave for your children and they are watching you but secondly if you have to have alcohol for your party then maybe it's more important to you than you think and let me tell you the people that never know that alcohol is a problem for you know who those people are the people that have a problem with alcohol and we settle for that buzz or that drink to get us to that place of happy. And God says, look man, I got so much more for you than that. All right, let me give you something else that I found, another principle, and that's the circumstantial evidence principle. I don't know if any of you guys, if you, okay, honestly, I need your honest opinion. I need your, your feedback right now. How many of you actually watched Matlock? Okay, come on, be honest. Be honest, you can say it. That means you're old. Okay, I get it. It means you're old if you watched Matlock. My wife and I, I never really watched Matlock. My wife loved Matlock. Uh, do we have any lawyers in the room? Any, any lawyers? Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. so Matlock's pretty much exactly what you live, right, as a lawyer, right? It's pretty accurate. Because what I learned from Matlock is if somebody is on the stand, if you just badger them long enough, they'll pretty much confess everything, right? Now, all I know about law is I learned from Matlock. I really don't know much beyond that, but I do know this. That circumstantial evidence never holds up, right? We all know that. If all you have is circumstantial evidence, Matlock will kill you in the cross, so, I want you to understand something about joy. That it is not to be based on circumstance. If all you have is circumstantial joy, you don't have joy at all. In fact, what you have is happy. Uh, and happy comes from the word happening. And happy only comes when everything that is happening around you is good. I don't know about you. That's not good enough for me. I would like more than that. Um, as I was reading, I found some crazy verses on joy, and they're from the, when the church first started. When the church first started, it was persecuted, and people were killed, and they had to give up their property. All kinds of crazy things happened, and yet I read this. Look with me at 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1. It says this, 
Now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, people being hunted and killed, right? Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Their joy was real, even in the midst of that. Crazy, right? Okay, next, Hebrews 10, 34. You sympathize with those in prison. You joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. Okay, underline this line. You accepted the confiscation of your property. All right, anybody ever buy a house that went down in value? Anybody ever experienced that? Yay! Right before we moved to San Diego, we bought a house and all it did was go down in value. There was never a time that it went up up in value. And I, I know this because I would walk my dog and I would walk past those realty signs and they all had that little piece of paper that you could pull out to find out what houses were going for. Oh my gosh, every time I'd walk my dog, another thousand, another five thousand. Every time I'm looking, man, I had to learn to walk my dog a new place, a worse neighborhood or something. I don't know, get me out of here. It was hard for me to handle when my house went down in value. These people are celebrating that their houses are being taken from them because they've learned that joy isn't based on circumstances. All right? Now, I don't know about you, but that's the kind of joy I want. Is there anybody with me? Okay, how do you get there? Well, let me give you a third principle. This is the party proximity principle. Okay, it's a well-known fact that if you want to enjoy the party, you've got to be in the center of the party. You can't be hanging out at the punch bowl, right? You've got to be in the middle. You've got to get your face painted. You've got to get in the bounce house. You, 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 you know, just go for it. You've got to be near the pinata, but not too near the pinata, right? I've seen enough America's Funniest Videos to realize that's a problem. Uh, several years back, uh, I'm an NBA fan. Anybody like the NBA? Anybody watch the NBA? Okay, I love the NBA. I'm a huge fan. But the one game I won't watch, any guesses? The All-Star game. Because the All-Star game is not really even a game. You know, they're throwing it off the backboard and they're doing all kind of hot dog tricks that none of them work. And it's, the score is 175 to 173. And nobody's playing defense. It's not really basketball. But one year, I got invited to the NBA All-Star game. Now, you can't buy a ticket to the All-Star game. You, it ha it's by invitation only, and a buddy of mine got two tickets, and he invited me to the game. Well, that was a whole different thing. I mean, I hadn't even walked in yet, and I'm standing there next to Jeff Probst. You know who that guy is? Survivor guy, right? And he, he's about this tall. And I just kept thinking to myself, I could totally kick that guy's butt. <laughs> I would be the survivor. <laughs> and I saw, I saw Ted Danson was there. He's much taller. I saw Tony Danza. You know who Tony Danza is? Yeah, Tony Danza was so close, I could ask him, who's the boss? All right? <laughs> and then we walked inside, and the lights, right before the game starts, the light go out, and this band starts playing live this song, ready, but I started to dance, you know, as poorly as I dance, and, you know, I started to, mm, white man's overbite, and you couldn't help it. I mean, I'd never pay to see outcasts, but there they were. It was amazing. And throughout the game, uh, different things happened. Kelly Clarkson sang happy birthday to Bill Russell. Uh, the Chicago Bucket Boys were playing their, their buckets, which is amazing. The Phoenix Gorilla. Do you know the Phoenix Gorilla? Was going out and dunking every moment. Any break in the action it was amazing. Because I was right in the center of the party. Now... You wonder how this is spiritual right now, right? <laughs> Let me read you some verses. Psalm 16, verse 11 says this. You have made known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy. Where? You see that? Where? In your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. That's where the joy is. Right next to God. Next verse. First Chronicles 29, 22. They ate and drank with great joy in the presence of the Lord that day. 
That's where you find joy. I got one more verse. It's Acts 2, 28, and it says, You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy. Where? You see, are you seeing this? In your presence. When I am close to you, when I'm walking with you, when I'm reading with you, when I take a walk with you, when I pray to you, when I keep you involved in my life, when I invite you into my work, that's the only place that I'm finding joy. All right? Let me ask you a, a couple quick questions, all right? These are going to be easy. You're going to get these, all right? When you go to Spaghetti Factory, what do you anticipate that they will serve at Spaghetti Factory? Anyone? Spaghetti. spaghetti. It's, it's, who said Spumoni? You're just messing with me. Do you like the Spumoni? I like the Spumoni. I'm okay with the Spumoni. And you can actually get lasagna, but most of the time, I'm getting mazithra and meat sauce, and I'm mixing it together. I'm getting spaghetti when you go to Spaghetti Factory. How about Starbucks? We go to Starbucks. What can you expect to get? Overpriced <laughs> coffee. But you're getting coffee of some kind. Somebody said hot chocolate. Now, do you guys are, you're teaching your kids to do this. I guess it's my fault. How about this? When you go to KFC, what can you expect to get? Come on. That's right. It's finger licking good. And you might gain a few pounds, but it's worth it at least once a year. Um, El Pollo Loco, same thing, right? Do you know that I have been to KFC and El Pollo Loco, both places, and I have gone to the drive through window. I said, I would like to order some chicken, please. And they said, we are out of chicken. How do you run out of chicken at El Pollo Loco? <laughs> right? When you, it's the natural, normal expectation when you go to these places that that's what you will get. Listen, if you are a Christ follower, it is the natural, normal part of life that you will experience joy. Psalm 10, verse 28, the prospect of the righteous is joy but the hopes of the wicked come to nothing. Psalm 97, 11, light shines on the godly and joy on those whose hearts are right. Listen, this should be part of our lives. Why is this not a bigger part of our life? Listen, before I let you go, I want to give you a couple of challenges. To, to figure out some ways to put this as a natural, normal part of your life. And the first is this. Find a joy mentor. Find somebody who just naturally has fun. That the, whenever you're with them, you're laughing more. Just find that person. Prioritize that person in your life. I have a person like that. Uh, his name is John. He's another pastor. He's in Santa Barbara. Whenever we're together, we're just laughing, laughing. I call him up. We're laughing about stuff. It, he's just awesome. He goes all over the world. And he does a bunch of amazing things. He's, he lives so much better than I do, but it, it's great. Here's the, you know, like, for example, we both do weddings. Um, I did a wedding for an NBA basketball player. I called him up, and he was doing a wedding for a Hollywood star right at the same time. He's always trumping me on this. But here was the great thing. Uh, at the NBA All-Star Game, he showed up, and he needed a ticket. And I didn't give him my ticket. <laughs> and he didn't get in. Yes! <laughs> Listen, John, John is that kind of joy mentor person. Jonathan is that joy mentor person. Uh, when, we do, when we're doing the podcast, one of the, one of the great joys of it is just that we laugh together. I think that's one of the reasons why people are listening to it, because they so rarely hear that kind of laughter. Um, Leslie is that kind of person in my life. Chad is that kind of person in my life. You know, Paul Murray comes into my, my office all the time, and we talk about difficult things, but we talk about fun things, and he's always, well, I call him Captain YouTube, because he's always got some stupid YouTube he wants to show me. I wish he'd work more. <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Let me give you another way to put joy in your life. Make finding joy a daily discipline. I think this is who God is. I think God is thrilled with what happens in the world. I love this quote. C.K. Chesterton put it like this. Because children are abounding vitality, because they are, in, they are in spirit, fierce and free, therefore, they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. 
And the grown-up person does it again and again until they're nearly dead. Have you experienced that? For grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt in monotony, but perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. Is it possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun? And every evening, do it again to the moon? It may not be automatically an automatic necessity that all daisies are alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never gotten tired of making daisies. It may be that he is the eternal appetite of infancy. For we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we are. When was the last time you enjoyed looking at a daisy or took a walk at sunset? Or put your feet in the ocean. I mean, we're 20 minutes away. And, and, it's 15 degrees cooler there. And yet we don't go. To celebrate. I heard it once quoted, it may also be C.K. Chesterton who said this, if the stars only came out once a year, we'd stay up all night to behold them. When was the last time you just went and looked outside? Okay, one more challenge. Seek God to do a 180 on your hard times. Okay, so here's the tough thing about joy. You're struggling. You're struggling with your kid. You have one that's off the rails. Your marriage isn't quite working. And your car transition, transmission is making a funny sound. And bills are coming. And you got issues. That's all of us. And that's why it's hard to talk about this. But God says, I can do a 180 on it. In fact, it's what he does. Psalm 30, verse 11, you turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth. You clothe me with joy. Psalm 51, 8, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. and Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Psalm 94, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. Jeremiah 31, 13, I will turn your mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. That is what God does. He can take the difficult and he can find joy in it and bring good to it. And I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of people who have gone through very difficult things and God has used that to help them give them their purpose so that they're now making the change in somebody else's life. This is who he is. Okay, I have one more challenge. And just about every third or fourth message at Canyon Springs ends with this same challenge, so you're probably over me. But here it is anyway. Get closer to the party. Get yourself on a mission trip. Now, here's why I bring it up. You don't have to go. I'm not going to make you feel guilty if you don't go. But those places are so full of joy. I was just in Alaska. And we, we painted and we did concrete. And then I stepped in the concrete. And we redid the concrete. And we were working at VBS. And we are just we were working all day long. It never gets dark. So you work. You know, it's like we started one work project at 7.30. We got done at 10.30. go, what the heck? It looks like it's 5 o'clock. Why am I so tired? Oh, yeah, it's 1030. But I, I got to tell you, and my, some of my team is here, we had so much fun. Um, some of the guys and I, we stayed in this back bedroom. We called it the dojo. Um, and the dojo, like, like if any young guys came in, um, like Ethan Cook would yell to them, bow to your sensei, and he'd make them bow. <laughs> I read to the dojo every night. I don't know if you guys even know this. I read to them. And I would read Talladega Nights quotes and Foghorn Leghorn quotes. And we would just say, oh my gosh. Doing the things of God, being that close, brings so much joy. And so many of you have experienced that. So this is how we're going to end today. We are going to not do a song. We are going to show you what that looked like in Alaska. So we're going to take our offering. And when the offering's done, we'll drop the lights so you can watch the rest of this video. I want to just show you some of the great things that God has done through your church. Listen, you make this possible. We are, this church goes around the world because you make it possible because you're joining God in what he's doing in the world. And look what you did. Roll the video.